for this book, I kind of had an idea of going back into my hero, Fort Gentry's past. He was a member of a, of a paramilitary force and his call sign was Sierra Six, which is where the title comes from. I think my idea initially for this book was I'd like to delve into Court's past, not exactly an origin story, but uh, to show you some of his background right. and keep it with something contemporary at the same time. An excerpt from today's guest, speaking about the 11th book in his Gray Man series. We'll speak with author Mark Greeny about Sierra Six right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. Welcome back. Today's guest is a number one New York Times bestselling author of over 16 thrillers. He has written or co-written seven Tom Clancy novels and the Audible original audio drama Armored, which has been optioned for a film by Sony Pictures. His latest book is called Sierra Six, the 11th book in the Gray Man series. It came out yesterday, and author Mark Greeny joins us now. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, we're honored, sir. This series is, is amazing. Thank and, you. Uh, and I was sent the, the book, but I have questions regarding your, your background. Sure. Uh, did you spend time in the military, or, or what was your interest in military? Uh, I spent no time in the military, honestly. My father, was, well, my grandfather was in the First World War in the Army, and my grandfather was in the Second World War. And uh, I tried to get into Air Force OCS out of college and uh, was not accepted. So I, I guess I was kind of uh, just a, a big reader of uh, mostly history, uh, Second World War, even Civil War, because I lived down here in the South. And sure. the Civil War was very fascinating to me growing up. And so um, th somehow it started to morph into the espionage realm. Honestly, that happened. Uh, the first thriller I ever bought in my life was Patriot Games, which is a Tom Clancy novel from the 80s. And I instantly made the switch from reading just solely nonfiction to uh, to fiction because you could learn so much about you know the reality that that was about the Irish Republican Army that I was very fascinated with at the time, and uh, and still have a great time doing it. So I just became a huge um, reader in fiction, espionage fi fiction, and military. And um, you know now as an author, to make your books realistic, I do you know you have to do some some hands-on stuff. So I do some training with the, yeah. the military and uh, law enforcement and stuff like that. But no military experience from the beginning. I just uh, just tried to wing it. Yeah. I, I did see pictures of you uh, in, in the cockpit of a, what, what what kind of fighter aircraft was that? That was an F-18. That was just a couple months ago in, uh, down at uh, in New Orleans with the Navy Reserve. A friend of mm -hmm. mine is an author and a, and a, a Naval Reserve uh, fighter pilot and he got me in the back seat of an F-18 and it was it was as, everything that you could imagine it might be it was great amazing yeah getting back to your current book that's that just came out it's the 11th novel in the series did you find it difficult to come up with a fresh plot line with this new book I always do <laughs> I think <laughs> since about book three it's been uh you know you finish one book and then you go oh my gosh I've gotten that thing and then things sort of materialize from uh, either from current events or from other reading you're doing, or just you ask yourself a series of what if questions. And um, for this book, I kind of had an idea of going back into my hero, Port Gentry's past. He was a member of a, of a paramilitary force and his call sign was Sierra Six, which is where the title comes from. And he was a basically just one guy out of six on a, on a team of paramilitaries. And, and they're in an operation in Pakistan. And then this book also is, takes place in the present time where he's a freelance intelligence asset and he uh, discovers something on a, on a mission in Algeria that, that relates back to his past. So th I think my idea initially for this book was I'd like to delve into Court's past, not exactly an origin story, but uh, to show you some of his background right. and keep it with something contemporary at the same time. Yeah. Uh, that's a good way to go. You have an, another recent um, project that's out as an audio, uh, audible original called Armored, which mm -hmm. I thought was really interesting because this is a new initiative by audible.com. Tell us a little bit about that project. Yeah, so Armored, Audible came to me several years ago 
uh, longer ago than I'd like to admit, because it took me a long time to, <laughs> to write this. But they came to me and they said, we're doing these new um, audible original audio plays. They're full cast dramas with sound effects and music and actors acting out all the parts. And they asked me if I'd be interested in, you know, taking one of those on. And at the time I'd been working on a screenplay for years and getting nowhere with it. I, I was very proud of the general story and the characters and my opening and all this, but I had, there were so many holes in it. And I'm just somebody who works well with a deadline and sort of doesn't work at all without a deadline. Yeah. And since I was writing the script just in my free time, I just wasn't working very hard. And when they came to me about this audio play, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you, I'll, I'll give you the 50 pages or whatever I have of this, if you like the story and where it's going, I will turn that into an audio play. So that's what I did. It ended up taking me a couple of years because it's, it's a difficult uh, transition <laughs> to, to write an audio play. But is it similar to writing a screenplay? Yes, it's absolutely closer to writing a screenplay than it is to writing a, uh, a novel by far. But you have to put all the sound cues in. And, um, oh, you know, I, I, I have never actually completed a screenplay. <laughs> I've worked on a couple. <laughs> and, um, you know, the problem is when you're an author that writes 500 page books, uh, 120 page screenplay is really hard. And, um, you know, I've been on like page 180 of my screenplay and feel it, feeling like I'm about halfway done and knowing <laughs> that it's it's no longer a screenplay. This needs to become a novel or it needs to sit on a shelf till I have time to to do it right but yeah the the audio play is very similar to writing a screenplay and then obviously once i hear the actors acting out all the roles um in the audio format it's uh it, it's really kind of neat not something i've ever experienced it's almost like a new genre of original yeah. stories and, yeah um, i've written screenplays and written short thrillers i enjoy writing screenplays and i just completed a book that's eighty six thousand words so mm -hmm. that was <laughs> going up a mountain that I'd never climbed before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I'm sure it's tough for screenwriters to, to write long form fiction, but yeah. I, I can, I can promise you people who write long form fiction, it's really tough to, to get that down into a screenplay. And then when you read a screenplay, you're, you just marvel at the, the mastery that it takes to, to abbreviate things and to convey these, you know, something I might spend three paragraphs on, you know, with a look or with a, you know, like with an aside. And um, right. so I'm, I'm fascinated by the genre. It's all in the action line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Getting back to the series, the first book in the series, um, the Gray Man series, was optioned as a film and it's coming out on Netflix this year. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, they filmed it last year um, in los angeles as well as in outside of paris and in prague and it's uh going to be a, a netflix film they're they're saying probably july it will be out Great. and they had a 200 million dollar budget it, so far it's uh, netflix's largest uh budget for any film they've ever made so uh, i'm excited to see it for sure did you have input into um obviously the story input but did, did you have input with the writer of the screenplay Yes, uh, it, the screenwriter was Joe Russo, who's one of the Russo brothers, and they're the directors of it. And they did all the art, the Marvel movies, Endgame, and Infinity War, and Captain America. And um, Joe and Anthony Russo had me come out to California while they were working on the screenplay and spend a few days with them, try, kind of to get my thoughts about, you know, what they were doing, but also in a larger sense about the series and where the series goes after book one. And then when they started the film they sent me the shooting script so i could see you know what they actually settled i'd, I'd read uh, an original script that joe had written uh, a few years ago and i hadn't seen anything else since so um they had a couple other screenwriters come in and they sent me that shooting script and uh I, it was terrific i was i was excited i i was more than assured because joe's original screenplay was so good you know i knew they were on the right track i knew it would be terrific but the the one they actually shot was fantastic did they change anything from the book That's oh absolutely great. yeah mm -hmm. i mean absolutely and and I, you know you have to and some people's philosophy is the the book should the film should absolutely mirror the book a i think that's pretty much impossible in most you know, cases. Right. And B, you know, the way I look at it is I'm a creative person and I'm, and I'm an artist. And uh, 
these directors are artists and these um, cinematographers are artists. And I think that the way I look at it is that everybody's putting their creative spin on my original <laughs> idea. And as long as it doesn't go so far afield, I think it's a good thing. There's things in the script that actually take place in other gray man novels. Um, and mm. I thought that was interesting. So it's, it, it's all about book one, the gray man, but it introduces some characters because their, their hope is to turn this into a franchise. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Today, February 16th, marks the 80th anniversary of the Marine Corps Raiders. And on Saturday, author Carol Averett will be here to talk about her new book, Marine Raiders, the true story of the legendary World War II battalions. And next week, another New York Times best-selling author, Steve Barry, will be here to talk about his latest book, a World War II-focused thriller called The Kaiser's Web. The Russians found the bodies, took them off, disposed of them. That was Stalin wanted to do that, so he wanted to keep the world off guard. So he wanted the world to think Hitler was still roaming around out there. That gave him the freedom of movement to do what he wanted to do in Eastern Europe. That's next time. Next time you're on YouTube, check out our Point of the Spear YouTube channel. We've got bonus video material from podcasts plus tons of military history videos, including full-length documentaries. It's a great way to spend some time, and don't forget to subscribe while you're there. And click the bell icon so you'll be notified of all the great weekly videos we're uploading. Getting back to, you mentioned uh, Tom Clancy in the beginning of our interview, and I watched a video that you had made about getting a call from your agent that... Tom Clancy wanted to work with you. Can you yeah. paint that picture of that moment when you got the call from your agent? Yeah, it, um, it, it's the funniest thing because I, to say I didn't see it coming isn't, is, isn't even touching on where, where I was mentally. I just turned in my third book. I'd only had paperback originals. The sec- I've only had two books out. And um, you know, I had a great editor and my new, I knew my editor was also Tom Clancy's editor. But I, as far as I know, we never even discussed Tom directly. And my agent called me one afternoon and I was in the midst of reading the newest Tom Clancy novel at that time, ironically. And he said, are you sitting down? And I said, yeah. And he said, how, how do you feel about writing the next Tom Clancy novel or co- co-authoring the next uh, novel with Tom Clancy? And I was immediately, I, was, I remember thinking like, I, I don't want to do it. That just sounds too scary and too daunting. <laughs> and I'm not ready for that. I wish you know, baby steps, find somebody else for me to work with that's not Tom Clancy, and then I'll work my way up. But I also knew that, you know, my agent would hang up in my face if I said, no, I'm not interested. And of course, I was interested because I was a massive Clancy fan going back decades and decades, like since 87 is when I got my first Clancy novel. And this was 2011. And so uh, I said, sure. And it wasn't uh, it wasn't a sure thing. They they just wanted to know if I was interested. The publisher did, and then I ended up writing uh, either twenty five or fifty pages, just as if it was in a Tom Clancy novel, just so I could show them that I knew who the characters were, how they would talk to each other, and and all that. And I gave them that, and then they had me fly up to Baltimore and meet Tom, and uh, and we did we did three books together before he passed away in two thousand and thirteen. Right. Yeah. How was it working with him? Did you learn a lot from him as a writer? Yeah, I I look at my my own books, uh, my Gray Man series, the first three books in that series. I I look at them as like one part of my life and then the the other books as being sort of a different animal from another part of my life because I'd started working with Clancy. So if you if you look at books four through 11 uh, of the Gray Man series, they're very different from the first three. I'm still very proud of the first three. Sure. Um, but they, they're a little, there's more intrigue. Uh, they go a little deeper with uh, some of the characterizations and all that. And it's it's all what I learned from Tom, just writing a bigger, wider, broader story that, you know, there's, there's room in a novel to, uh, you know, as long as you don't bore people, as long as you make it an interesting story, there's room in a novel to, to explore all the facets that, that you want to explore. D- did the length of your books grow longer or shorter? Just... <laughs> they grew longer. Uh, okay. Everything is everything's longer. My new book, Sierra Six, is about a hundred and sixty thousand words, I think, and it's not my longest uh, gray man novel. Uh, oh. It's probably you know it's probably in the middle or a, a little bit more than average. And I, I wrote a a co-authored a, a novel called Red Metal a few years back, which was a military thriller, and that ended up being two hundred and seventeen thousand words. And 
you know, it's very sort of Clancy-esque in that regard. And that's, that's completely the Tom Clancy effect <laughs> on my, on my life and on my writing. Do you find that your readers in this genre like a longer book or a shorter book? Yeah, I've had very, very few complaints. I've had a couple of people say, say that the books are too long, but I mean, nine, 95 out of 100 people don't feel that way. And it's the way that I like to tell stories. So, I mean, there's obviously authors that, that write 80, 90, 100,000 word books, and some of those are great books. And I, uh, I always say, like, I don't get paid more for a bigger book. It's totally a self-inflicted wound on my part because I end up spending months and months writing when, you know, I, I passed the 100,000 word month, you know, mark three months earlier, and I'm still working on the novel. Um, but it's just kind of when I map out the story at the beginning, I kind of have an idea of how long it'll be, and I'm always wrong. So it's always longer than I think it's going to be. But, you know, once I go through the editing process, I, if, if it doesn't belong, I take it out. And if it's not right. part of the story, I take it out. But still end up pretty long. Yeah, I was going to ask you about your writing process. Do you have a, um, a certain way of writing, like getting up early or getting a certain number of words done per day? Yes. Um, it, it, ideally, I will start work early. Um, I got married last year and I have stepkids and so there's carpool and all that. So I don't really start as early as I used to. Um, but maybe I'm just using that as an excuse for not <laughs> getting up as early as I used to. But um, I do like to write first thing uh, as soon as everything else is taken care of and just write as long as I can in one you know, fell swoop. So I might write from eight to noon or from seven to noon and the, the afternoon I will basically do some of the business of writing that has to be done, the publicity and all that, or I'll do some research or I'll read another book or something like that. So um, most virtually all of my running, my writing is done before noon and uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's worked for me this far. And do you have a word count that you kind of set out that you want to accomplish per day? I do. And the word count keeps changing as you miss, <laughs> as you fail to reach it. <laughs> I, but I, I like to 2000 words is, is a good day for me. And I, you know, I always joke with my family. I'm like, if I can write 2000 words in the morning, I'm happy the rest of the day. If I get hit by a truck, I'd still be happy. But um, <laughs> if you don't write your 2000 words at the beginning of a project, as, as you get closer to the deadline, then that becomes a 3,000 word day or a 3,500 word yeah. day. I like to go, uh, I'll take a trip. I'll just go fly to Chicago or DC or someplace and just lock myself in a hotel room for 10 days or two weeks. And uh, I can write six, 7,000 words a day doing that. So that always happens at the end, you know, right as I get to deadline, I go find a place to, to hole up in. Yeah, that's, that's good to know where you just kind yeah. of uh, sequester in a, in a hotel room. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Out the world. Yeah, nothing, nothing matters, yeah. I noticed that your Armored audiobook, you have it coming out as, as a book now. I was curious about that because it's listed in, in the catalog and it's coming out in July and it says inspired by the audiobook. What was the process like turning an audiobook back into a novel? Yeah, so I own the intellectual property for Armored. So, uh, you know, we decided that my publisher read the the audio play and they wanted it as a novel and actually a series of novels. Um, so I did a two book deal with them to, to, to turn it into a novel. It's not exactly the same story. It's, it's expanded as you can imagine. Um, I just finished my copy edits for it today and it's about 500 pages and um, it tells a, a bigger, broader story than, than the audio play. The audio play is, always going to be kind of my baby you know that's the it, yeah. like it's it's very very cool to listen to and i think it's a, a great way to spend five and a half hours if you're if you're doing something else and you want to really dig into something um but the book yeah it'll be out in, in july and it's the first in a series about uh my the, the hero of, of armored and what he's going through I'll, I'll definitely look forward to it but the current book that's out today is sierra six Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You bet. I enjoyed it. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Today, February 16th, marks the 80th anniversary of the Marine Corps Raiders. And on Saturday, author Carol Averett will be here to talk about her new book, Marine Raiders, the true story of the legendary World War II battalions. And next week, another New York Times bestselling author, Steve Berry, will be here to talk about his latest book, 
a World War II focused thriller called The Kaiser's Web. The Russians found the bodies, took them off, disposed of them. That was Stalin wanted to do that. So he wanted to keep the world off guard. So he wanted the world to think Hitler was still roaming around out there. That gave him the freedom of movement to do what he wanted to do in Eastern Europe. That's next time. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. You can find me on Twitter at Rob Child, where you can share your comments about the show. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spirit. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.